Hi, everybody. Welcome back to The Patty Brennan Show. Whether you have $20 or $20 million, this show is for those of you who want to protect, grow, and use your assets to live your very best lives. Joining me again today is Dr. Joseph Coughlin, the director of the MIT Age Lab. And if you listened to the first podcast we did, and if you didn't, definitely go back and listen to that first because we kind of teed it up in terms of talking about some of the issues that that Dr. Joe and, frankly, we have discovered over the last year or so. And in this podcast, what we're going to be talking about are some of the solutions that MIT Age Lab and many others are coming up with to make quality of life better for every American. Joe, thanks so much for joining us again. Patty, it's always a delight to be here with you and a lot of fun, too. Absolutely. And for those of you who did watch the prior podcast, uh, you will remember that I made a, a, a note that I am wearing sneakers in honor of Dr. Joe Coughlin. Now, in between shows, he actually sent me a picture of himself, and he's got the bow tie on, he's got the jacket, he's got the, the bright blue pants, and what color are your sneakers? Red, white, and blue vans. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. So, and that's, you guys, that is Dr. Joe. He is brilliant. He is kind. I told the story of uh, something that he did for me a couple months ago. But more importantly, he's real. I mean, we're all real. And that's that's the most important thing that I want you to get out of this. We're here to hopefully make a difference in the lives of everybody watching and listening. And I can't think of anybody better to do that than Joe Coughlin. So, Joe. Oh, thank you, Patty. Let's start off. I got to tell you that I have ordered a hundred or more books that you wrote, the, uh, the Longevity Economy. I love that book. In fact, I just gave it to the CEO of a Fortune 500 company about a month ago. He read it in two days, and he loved wow. it. So, and it's, what I loved about the book is it, it talks about, it gave us some history in terms of evolution and this narrative of the aging process and where it came from and what your goal is to change that narrative and to say, hey, look, it's just a different season of life. It can be as good or even better than prior seasons. And for many people, it really is. But I think that for me, what I've learned, thanks to you, is to how to build some structure around making sure that you've got that quality of life. And it's not just about money. It's about you know, people, because really, at the end of the day, that really is what makes a rich life. So, you know, I, I don't want to get folks depressed, Patty, but just to reinforce your, your, your thinking, think about it. every other stage of life from your young age to middle school age to high school to college to working for 30, 40, whatever years. Believe it or not, there's all kinds of stories and rituals and celebrations that punctuate your life as you go along. You reach about 60 or 65, the punctuation points are other people's celebrations that you are invited to. So as part of our retirement planning, we need to prepare what are the celebrations we want? What are the, uh, the, the, the finish lines that we're looking for, the goals and expectations? Not just the, the general values, but we need to structure that one-third of adult life that we currently call retirement because society is still writing that book. But we have to write our individual ones today. Absolutely. You know, if there is nothing else that I've learned over the years of, of working with you, you have solidified one thing for me, Joe. You want to know what it is? I am never going to retire. It ain't happening. No. Because this is too, first of all, I, again, for me, and I can just speak for me, this gives me such a purpose, and it makes me feel great to meet with people, to do the befores and the afters, and to know that because we're in their lives, they have peace of mind. And I love the fact that it's we're always growing, we're always learning, we're always changing. We're always trying to figure out what else can we do? What else can we do? And for me, that's fun. And, you know... It, it, and I do think about it because many of our clients, you know, are approaching or have retired. And it has helped me and my entire team to really make that process easier, that transition much richer without the ambiguity and the worries and the fears that they may have had if, you know, we weren't sharing some of the information with them in advance. 
In retiring, a lot of people should think about it, does not necessarily mean stopping work. It means a change. I mean, even the very definition of vacation is a change in routine. Living on the beach for the rest of your life actually becomes work because it becomes routine, if you will. So when people retire, quite often what we find is, no, I retired from the gig I've been doing for 30 or 40 years, but I'm still working, or I'm volunteering with Verve, or I, I've got so many other things to do that change that routine to keep me engaged, productive, and excited uh, in, in older age. No, simply retiring with the old brochure thinking of it's all about beaches, golf courses, and, and, and bike rides, that may be good for a few weeks, but a one-third of adult life, I'm not sure how many people are going to be happy with that. It's so true, and I love it when someone comes in and they they invariably say the same thing, maybe a little different way, and that is, I don't know when I ever fa- had time to go to work. I'm so busy. I'm doing this and that. And that, to me, is where the real joy comes from. It's just a different form. It's It's a lot of variety. It's a lot of fun being around people they really enjoy. So let's talk now a little bit about, okay, how do we build some structure? What are some of the things that you are all working on at MIT? And I'm I'm going to kind of tee this up for you, Joe, this this concept of virtual assisted living. Folks, for for those of you who are listening and watching, just remember three letters, V-A-L. That is the future. Actually, it's not the future. It is here now. So, Joe, let's talk about VAL. So let's let's start from the top as something we saw during the pandemic, and then we can certainly talk about some real projects that we're doing in the lab that are that are essentially underpinning a virtual assisted living. So I want all your listeners to ask themselves or to admit, maybe to their friends, what were they doing March of 2020? We know what they were doing. They were going out and they were buying toilet paper by the pallet load. Well. You know, some people may say that's silly, but think about it. When you are feeling a little out of control, you buy the one thing that you know that with any luck you're going to be needing and using. So that was rationally irrational, if you will. But we also found that people were out there buying something else. They were buying technology by the boatload. They were buying tablets and smart speakers and smart doorknobs and cameras and sensors alike. And what they were starting to do is they were starting to nest or create a whole home, if you will, that was much more focused on being connected in a time when we weren't connected. But here's the fun part. And this is the, to make a few of your listeners that are on the younger side, maybe uh, uh, make them smile because it's going to sound like I'm taking a pop shot. How many of us remember our adult children or many of our own that, you know, we didn't own a car. We only used a ride hailing system. We didn't want to make a meal. We called it to be delivered. We couldn't fix a cabinet counter, so we called somebody in by app. Essentially, life by app. But, Patty, what we found during COVID and certainly now as it's starting to ebb, that all those technologies combined with all those on-demand services, whether it's Uber or Grubhub or DoorDash or, you know, you can the names are endless, TaskRabbit, whatever it might be, all those things started to come together to provide convenience for those that were starved for convenience, connectivity in middle age because you were managing parents and children in your own life, but ultimately provided care, actually, for those that we loved at a distance. Essentially, it was the long arm, typically the caregiver, of the adult daughter reaching into the lives of older adults using many of the systems and many of the services that only a short few years ago were like, wow, you're really kind of either lazy or really convenience hungry. And what we found here at the lab is that that created an entirely new virtual assisted living that in the word of this, words we like to use at MIT, that were being hacked by families that when they couldn't do high touch, they used high tech instead. Wow, that is so interesting. I can tell you, Joe, I am one of those people because in March of last year, my grandson was being born. And of course, I had an Android and I couldn't go see my new grandson. So what did I do? Of course, I got an iPhone and I was able to do FaceTime. And what that led to was, boy, this is pretty cool. Maybe I'll get that watch too. So I got the watch. I got to tell you, this watch is really cool. I never, ever, like, kept track of my steps or, you know, looked at it for, you know, it keeps my schedule, it does all of that. And the thing that really kills me that I didn't realize or wouldn't have realized if I didn't have this watch, 
I guess I don't breathe very much because this thing's always yelling at me. It's saying, breathe, Patty, breathe. And it's it's really kind of, okay, or stand up. That's the other thing. Stand. Or you haven't closed your rings. I mean, in part, this is what we call it's for the worried well that are living the quantified life. Mm-hmm. But it is, and, and to use the psychology term, it is those uh, uh, those little nudges that can make us healthier uh, and, and, and make a difference. You know, you and I both have the same same issues, that we, we look very calm on the outside, but the fact that neither one of us is breathing enough uh, tells us that you know, we're like a duck, very calm on the surface and paddling like hell underneath. And we love it, right? It, it is wonderful. It gets us up in the morning. It keeps us inspired to do our good work. Uh, and it's also good to know, and it's good to have those reminders, because as you brought up in the prior p- podcast, you know, if we're not doing some of these things, it's really not good. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, they say that, you know, sitting is the new smoking, right? If you're sitting all day long, you might as well be smoking a pack of cigarettes. It's really not good for us, right? You know, we, we, we might want to start thinking, as annoying as some people may feel it to be, that we may want to start thinking about how these technologies might help us structure certain roles and rituals and things we do every day. And I know a lot of people are saying, what are you kidding? I'm in my 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s and beyond. I don't need a watch pinging me. But for those who are retired, one of the things that work provided, that children in the home provided, was a demanding structure. And I know that part of retirement is getting away from that structure and creating your own. But that's the point. You need to create structure every day to keep you engaged, to keep you social, to do the things that keep you healthy. Because otherwise, the loss of those institutions of work, family, volunteering, and and the like, you start to lose the very physical, social, and emotional health that you used to enjoy because of all those reinforcing things. That is such a good point. And, we, and you know, we see it, right, in our society. You know, depression, anxiety, it, it's just rampant. And I can't help but wonder if, you know, that isolation and that, you know, lack of kind of being as engaged as we used to be in those institutions is a part of it. No, we, we are seeing an epidemic. Three in 10 Americans said that the pandemic has already had a negative health, uh, a negative impact on their mental health. And those are August 2021 data. And that, that stress, 39% of people say they are under regular stress, or a third of them are saying that they feel like they have bouts of depression because of that loneliness, social isolation, uh, and the like. So that lack of structure, the very thing we want to get rid of in retirement, Just make sure that you replace somebody else's structure with a structure that keeps you healthy and engaged. And, you know, when you think about this concept of the virtual assisted living, it's it's exactly what you just said. It's like just a nudge, right? It's just a reminder of, oh, by the way, think about standing up or take a deep breath or something of that nature. And I can't help but wonder if that can be used to really... Um, how shall I say, really enhance a person's social life, if you will. You know, we talked in the earlier podcast about the implications of this social security and the lack thereof and the implications on a person's physical, emotional, and mental health, uh, their cognitive health. Um, You know, people just kind of slow down when they don't have to engage with other people, right? Yeah. And, and and social media for all its negative effects. Facebook now is being called, if you will, the social media nursing home, even though I'm on there uh, myself with my students or not. But what we're finding is that some of these technologies, even social media, who has earned great malignment, if you will, uh, uh, is a way of keeping in touch with old friends, family members and, and, and the like. Uh, I know that in my lab, you know, you and I were talking, Patty, and you, when you've visited in the past, you know, we have uh, essentially a toy shop of different technologies. That robotics, uh, certainly, you know, a robot's not going to uh, replace a real person, but some of the robots are now are connecting people back and forth. We have one system we developed years back on tele-exercise, where you could do exercises that kept you fit so you could safely continue driving for a lifetime but also exercises that you could do with people halfway around the world. We had one MIT alum that was doing exercise with someone in Taiwan because, frankly, in Taiwan, they were waking up while he was doing his evening exercises here in Boston. So technology is not a replacement for high touch, 
But in lieu of any touch at all, high tech fills the gap. That's wonderful. And I, I know that you guys have been working on the cameras and the sensors and, and things of that nature. And I think that that's really important without being too invasive. Um, and I just, I, I, I have this vision of what the home of the future is going to look like. Because, you know, let's face it, the, you know, I was visiting a client this weekend in, you know, in a assisted living facility, one of those continuing care communities. And it's fine, um, but it's not their home. And, you know, if given the choice, I think they'd rather be in their own home. But they didn't have the this they didn't have the services. They didn't have the support that they felt that they needed because, you know, one spouse was having is having some cognitive issues and they're really big issues. And it was getting to the point where her husband could no longer care for her. So that's why they needed to make that decision. And I can't help but wonder, you know, even as, you know, we all get older. I mean, I think it would be kind of interesting as you and I kind of brainstorm about this. Wouldn't it be interesting to think about or to survey our clients and ask them, gee, have you really ever thought about what it would be like to just stay in your home forever? Even if, you know, even if you do, like, we were talking before, you know, if you can't take out the trash by yourself anymore, do you have somebody who could do it for you? Yeah, you know, you, you and I were talking about the difference between planning and preparation. And, and as I like to say, you can plan to have dinner and you can even make a shopping list. But till it's in the plate or at least in your, your uh, uh, grocery store cart, you're not really prepared. So I think you're right. It would be great to hear whether or not the, your, your listeners and, and, and folks you work with are they prepared? Do they have someone that they would trust to come into their mother's home? And you say, let's, let's make a storyline up. Yeah. You no, know, your mom is frail. She lives by herself. Or you're frail and live by yourself. Do you have the name of someone that you would let cross that threshold to do all those big and little things we call life? That's a really good point. And if, if nothing else, it just bubbles up the awareness. And even the routine things that we all kind of take for granted that we can do, changing a light bulb or fixing a railing or, you know, just even regular. Taking, taking out the trash, yeah. cleaning, you know, little things. And, and those are the things that they, they start to pile up on us or we get tired or don't feel like doing, uh, you know. But also that that's a new cost in return because quite often those things were either done or helped out by adult children. Mm -hmm. And now that we have the lowest birth rate in history, or that we've encouraged our kids to move away. You know, Patty, one of the links you and I have is you're a Philadelphia boy, but I no longer live in Philadelphia. So family down there, you know, God love them. I'm still, I'm 350 miles up the coast now. Uh, and so do we have that long arm of tech and services that we can rely on when family has uh, either never been born, has moved away, or frankly is busy with their own life? Hey, Joe, I've got an idea. How about you and I, how about MIT and Key Financial team up together? And how about if we just put together like a survey? And it would be really cool because we can come up with the routine, we can come up with the just you know, five, 10 questions. Maybe some of the questions are, what are the tasks that you're finding finding to be more and more difficult to do as you age? And then asking the questions, do you have somebody that could do that for you if you're no longer able to do it for yourself? What do you think about that idea? I think that's that's a fantastic idea, Patty. So count, count the age lab, MIT in. I, I think that'd be great because you know, one of the things we want to do at Age Lab is not just to write papers and develop new technologies and new ideas, but with partners like you, we want to invent life tomorrow. But I want life tomorrow not just to be longer, I want it better. Um, so maybe we can get folks to start thinking about how they can make that happen in their own lives. I love that idea, Joe. I love that. I love that about you. I love that about your mission. And, you know, we have a great we have an amazing group of people that we can reach out to who I know would would be happy to answer a survey and to give you at the Age Lab and us additional insight into those things that maybe we haven't crossed yet and you don't know until you're there. So let's do that. And folks, those of you who are listening and, 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 and watching, be on the lookout. 
We're going to be sending an email survey. It'll probably come in the next few weeks. And we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your experiences, the things that you worry about. Help us to develop what Joe just referred to, that that future life. Help us to improve quality of life, your life, and the lives of others. And just to kind of prep that up, uh, uh, Patty, to give people uh, insight that they are not alone. 87% of us, at least as of two years ago, said that we want to age in place. That is where our marriage, our mortgage, and our memories are. We want to stay in that house. Sadly, unfortunately, 47% of us believe we will not be able to do so. Right, so this is a great thought experiment to figure out, are you ready? Are you prepared? Yeah, and, and they don't have the solutions yet. They don't know how they would do it. So this will be the beginning of this new stage, this new new, you know, idea bank, if you will, in terms of, you know, what are the issues? Why do people move out in the first place? And what can you do now to make sure you're prepared? So, Joe, thank you so much. This has been, as always, a phenomenal podcast. You know, it's a brainstorming opportunity, guys. What you see is what you get. We don't practice this stuff. We sometimes don't even talk about it before we come on air. But this is the relationship that we have with the lab and specifically with Dr. Joe. He is, and he has become such a good friend of mine, and I'm so grateful. I'm honored that he even spends the time with us. And I'm so happy that we can do something for them to really help them to create that new future for everybody. So... Well, Patty, yeah. I have to say that, as my mother used to say, this may sound like the Mutual Admiration Society to your oh. listeners, but as you know, I work with financial advisors in many different countries. We manage one of the largest panels of financial advisors in the world. And you're not just a great person, you're one of the best. Oh. So thank you for having me. You betcha. You betcha. So thank you all. And, and really, since we're doing this Mutual Admiration Week, wouldn't do this if it wasn't for all of you. It really makes a difference. You give us our purpose. And I so appreciate the fact that you are sharing this podcast and other podcasts. It's become viral. It's been amazing. So thanks to you for tuning in. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful year end with the, your family and the people that you love. Thank you so much for joining us today. Take care. Bye-bye.